But before I get into to more of, of my main talk, I just want to explain where the Onondaga land rights case is procedurally, because it was on, I think most of us know, that it was stayed shortly after it was filed. The, the state and other defendants asked to have it held with no action. And that stay was just lifted um, earlier, well, just last week. Um, the agreement that we had reached in uh, August of last year was that the case would just sit there until there was a final determination of the Cuyuba land claim by the Supreme Court. <coughs> As we know, they declined to hear it, and so the stay was lifted. Um, the state will file a motion to dismiss the Onondaga land rights um, based on the grounds of latches and on 11th Amendment immunity that precludes the state from being sued. That has to be filed by August 15th. The nation's response will be filed on October 16th, two months later. The state gets a reply one month later, and then it's in the hands of Judge Kahn, a federal judge in Albany, who will decide that motion to dismiss. We're confident that if we get a fair hearing on the history and the law, that we can prevail. I'm not so confident we can get a fair hearing. The nation, although it's very reluctant to enter our courts because they are a separate nation and they have their own sovereignty, we, we do enter courts in other areas. We're involved in hunting and fishing rights, attempts to protect the burial sites and archaeological sites. We have stopped grave robbing in, in Buffalo using federal statutes. However, that becomes very hard in New York State because New York is one of four states, only four states, have no law protecting unmarked graves. New York happens to be in that distinctive category. And so, unless there's a federal involvement in a project, the rights to, to stop the looting of archaeological sites or even graves is very limited in, in state situations. We try to be involved in environmental protection, um, and I think we know quite a bit about that. That's not what we're going to talk about tonight. We're involved in fighting state taxation, both property and excise taxes. The nation filed a friend of the court brief in the Kennewick case, where the Ninth Circuit gutted the federal Native American graves repatriation and protected. But the main situation that we're involved with, as everyone knows, is the land rights action. And the history is really very clear. Larry's provided some of it here. And as I said before, I want to leave you with two main concepts tonight, the doctrine of discovery and land speculation. And we'll get back to each of those. The history is so clear that in the Cayuga land claim, Judge McCarran issued a 91-page decision on latches, and he said it did not apply to the Cayuga that they had done everything they could during the intervening years before they filed their land claim. And on the other hand, he ruled that New York knowingly violated federal law. There's no doubt about this. That ruling is still standing. The Second Circuit didn't overrule that. They just brushed it aside and ignored it. Similar ruling has occurred in the United case as it's gone up and down and back and forth to the Supreme Court. And in Sherrill, the Supreme Court specifically said, we're not touching those rulings. And so what we have now are we have court-recognized knowing violations of federal law by New York State when it took the Oneida and Cayuga land. They violated the law, but now the courts have said there is no remedy. Cayugas are landless. This is not fair. You don't need me to tell you that. And yet, that's the law that we've seen come down over the last year and a half. And there's no question that New York knowingly violated the federal law, federal treaties, and the, and the federal constitution. And we'll get into more of those details. There's also no question that the wealth of the early republic and early New York State was built on the sale of stolen land, 
on the exploitation of resources from the land. The salt is the clearest example. And in order to boil the salt, they clear cut most of the forest within 50 to 100 miles of here and made vast amounts of money. Salt was gold back then. There was no refrigeration. It was how you preserved meat and fish. It's, um, the amount of money made off the salt is, is phenomenal in, in modern terms. But land speculation was more about what Larry talked about some, to some extent. You send some people out to get rice and land out to the west that is not really approachable now, with the idea that in 10 to 20 years it's going to uh, increase in value 10 to 20 times. All of the founders of our country, Washington, Jefferson, John Marshall, were land speculators. New York State, at the end of the Revolutionary War, ended at about Schenectady. Broke, no money, no land, no way to pay the soldiers. It had to have the Haudenosaunee land. That's the background that New York is operating off in 1788 when it begins to take the Haudenosaunee land. And in the last year and a half, our courts have said, that's too bad, you have no remedy. There is no justice for the Cayugas. So I hope that we can all work together to change that. It's going to take a lot of work, but I think we have a good foundation to do that here in central New York, based on the work of so many of you in this room. Because since the filing of the Onondaga mm -hmm. land rights on March 11, 2005, the rules have suddenly changed. And they've suddenly changed dramatically against the Haudenosaunee. First, we had the Sherrill decision by the Supreme Court in late March, about two weeks after our filing. That case was bad enough. But then the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City, in a divided decision, three to two, with a sharply worded and correct dissent, two to one, I'm sorry. The dissent is correct, and it really takes serious issue with the uh, laziness and bad law that the majority wrote. We'll get back to that a little bit. But the Second Circuit said that even though New York had violated the law, knowingly, when it took the Cayuga land, the Cayugas are not without a remedy because of the legal fiction of latches. So the Cayugas have a federally protected reservation, protected by the Canandaigua Treaty. And we'll get back to what the treaty says. The treaty is still valid. The United States government told the Cayuga people in 1794, we recognize that you have 64,000 acres, and we promise that you have that forever. I guess the Second Circuit forgot that last June when they dismissed their land. So how can we understand Cheryl and Cuba? I've spent a lot of time trying to do that over the last year. I've read each of them a dozen times. I've read a half a dozen new law review articles that have been written since they were written. Every one of them is critical. Every one of them tears those two decisions apart. And they tear them apart because they're not well written. They're not good law. They don't follow the rules that they say they, that the courts say they should abide by. They're simply bad law. Latches is a concept of equity. In our law, we have two main bodies coming out of the English tradition. There's law and there's equity. Law is the written stuff with our statutes and procedures and all of that. And then every once in a while, we're supposed to get equity in there. Fairness. Fairness. That's what equity is. It means that sometimes you have to step outside the hard written law to get to a fair, just result. Latches is an equity defense. Doesn't seem like that to the Cayugas, I can tell you that. 
and it violates some very fundamental principles of equity. One of them is that equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy. If you've been wrong, equity is supposed to guarantee that you get a remedy, not take it away from you. And the other fundamental principle is that to benefit from equity, or an equitable defense particularly, and that's New York got the benefit of a defense, one must have what we call clean hands. You can't come in there having violated the law and then get the benefit of equitable protection. You don't see that discussed in either one of these opinions. You see it discussed in law review articles by Professor Joseph Singer of Harvard, who is outraged at these decisions. And he's outraged because they're not justice. They're not justice under law, not justice under equity. They ignore our country's treaty obligations to the Haudenosaunee people. They ignore clear, uncontroversial violations of federal law, the Trade and Intercourse Act of 1790 that's still in effect, it's been amended a few times. We'll get back to that. They ignore clear violations of the federal constitution. They just couldn't get to face real justice. So we have to work to get us back to where perhaps there will be justice. These decisions in this period are merely the latest chapter of US history in our shameful history of racism against Native people. So eventually, my conclusion is stark. If it's not about law and justice, how do we explain it? And that's where we look back at history. What has happened? What's been the basis? How have we treated native people? We've driven them off their land. We've forcibly removed them. We've engaged in scorched earth in the form of the 1779 Sullivan Clinton campaigns that we'll come back to. We've had biological warfare, as I talked before, and, and uh, smallpox, but the whole thing, all of the um, Indian law in the United States is based upon the doctrine of discovery. Now this is a medieval, imperialist, racist doctrine. How many of you have heard of the doctrine of discovery? I think that's a much higher percentage than we find in the normal population. But we have to look back at it historically. It was first used, to some extent, to justify the Crusades and the invasion by the European Christians of Muslim lands. But it came into full bloom in the 1400s. The 1400s. This is the kind of theory that we're using today, that our courts are using today, to deny justice to the Because in the 1400s, the Europeans began to plunder Africa. And then they discovered the new world. I don't know how many of you remember Flip Wilson. He had a great skit on, I done discovered America. I can't do any justice to <laughs> And shortly after Columbus landed, the next year, the Pope issued a papal bull that said, when Christian nations discover non-Christian lands, all the power transfers to the discovering Christian nation. There's a very recent law review article written by Professor Robert J. Miller, 2006, in the Idaho Law Review, that defines the doctrine of discovery. And he defines it as this. In a nutshell, the doctrine of discovery means that when European Christian nations first discovered new lands, the discovering country automatically gained sovereignty and property rights in the land of the non-Christian, non-European nation, even though obviously the natives already owned, occupied, and used these lands. In addition, the discoverer also gained sovereign governmental rights over the native peoples and their governments 
which restricted tribal international political relationships and trade. This transfer of political, commercial, and property rights was accomplished without the knowledge nor the consent of the Indian people. So that merely by landing, the Europeans took possession of the land and took possession of the title. Now really, it was, a, it was a convenient way for the Europeans not to fight too much over who, who was going to get which land. That was one of its primary interests, but it also had an obviously negative impact on the native people of, the, of, of this continent and South America. It was used by all European governments. Larry and I were talking beforehand about the uh, so-called Louisiana Purchase of 1803. Well, what did we purchase? We didn't go out to the native people who owned the land and get it from them. We made a deal with the French government for their right to take the land. It was used by the English very actively in New York. It was used by the United States and then by New York State. And it was used by our government repeatedly as we took progressive swaths of land from the native people. It was first brought into our courts in 1823. The case was Johnson versus McIntosh, set down uh, by Chief Judge John Marshall, himself a land speculator, owned land over in Tennessee that nobody was really living on, no Europeans were living on, that later became more valuable. Actually, later in his career, in the 1830s, Marshall tried to undo the doctrine unsuccessful. There's an excellent book on the doctrine of discovery um, by Professor Lindsay Robertson called Conquest by Law that I highly recommend that breaks down the artificial way that this doctrine was used in that particular situation, but it is part of our law. It was first brought into the Supreme Court law in 1823. But it's not just an old medieval European concept. The first footnote in the Sherrill case refers to and incorporates the doctrine of discovery. 2005, it's the basis of our Indian law. It says that European Christians have more right to the land than the people who've lived on it since time and memorial. It's right there. And it's how we get to these incredibly unjust results. The doctrine is, is actively criticized by several international law rulings against the United States that have found that their handling of Native people is not fair. That same article by Professor Miller As a criticism, now this is a, again, this is not Joe Wheat, this is Professor Robert J. Miller. He teaches out in Oregon, but this article is in the Idaho Law Review. And he says the doctrine has been severely criticized, and rightly so, as a fictional justification for the European colonization and subjugation of the New World. A close look at the origin and development of this legal doctrine, legal is quote, does leave one thinking more of the adage, might make right, rather than the principal development of law in an insular society where all of the people share rights and obligation of the law. In fact, the cynic might conclude that the legalistic international law doctrine of discovery was nothing more than an attempt to put a patina of legality on the outright confiscation of almost all assets of the people of the New World. Because until we work together to get rid of that racist doctrine, there can never be true justice for the Haudenosaunee. 
So let's step back a minute and look at the legal basis of the Land Rights Act. It's really pretty clear this law. It's been decided in two other cases. Those rulings stand. But whenever I talk about the land rights action, I always read the first paragraph. Most of you have probably heard me read this in one context or another, but we have to, I just feel that I have to do this. And I think most of you know that we were instructed in the Longhouse by the leaders of the Onondaga Nation to put this paragraph as the first paragraph after all the other legalese and historic stuff, before all the other legalese and historic stuff. And I think most of you know that the nation's website has the complaint online, onondaganation.org, and it has a lot of the history within the complaint, if you want to look there. But the first paragraph is just profound, I think. And it reads, the Onondaga people wish to bring about a healing between themselves and all others who live in this region that has been the homeland of the Onondaga nation since the dawn of time. The nation and its people have a unique spiritual, cultural, and historic relationship with the land, which is embodied in the great law of peace. This relationship goes far beyond federal and state legal concepts of ownership, possession, or other legal rights. The people are one with the land and consider themselves steward of it. It is the duty of the nation's leaders to work for a healing of this land to protect.